read 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. I want to read verses 1 through 12, although our message this morning will be verses 3, 4, and 5. So let's begin reading 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit or by word or by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholds, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And of course, he goes on there to remind the Thessalonians, verse 13, that they are not of this number because they have received the love of the truth and God is working in them. So what we've been learning here is about this coming time period that we call the day of the Lord, or verse 2 of chapter 2, the day of Christ. And we have seen from 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, that this day of Christ, just like the first coming of the Lord, the second coming of the Lord is a series of events. Just like the first coming began with the incarnation of our Lord and ended with his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into the clouds. So too the day of the Lord is a series of events. The second coming of the Lord is a series of events that begins with what? It begins with what Paul gave to this church as new revelation. That is what we commonly know as the rapture of the saints. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's remind ourselves of these things. Verse 13. When Paul writes to them and says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That is, those bodies that are asleep in Jesus. That you sorrow not, even as others that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now let's pause there and note that verses 13 and 14 are not new revelation. That this was taught in our Old Testament. But verse 15 and following is new revelation. You will not find this in the Old Testament prophecies. So let's look at it again, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, 
we which are alive. Now note Paul includes himself that could be happening at any time. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Now this is very important. Where's the location of this? In the, it's in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now that is new revelation that Paul gave. So there's coming a day, which we call the gathering of the church, the gathering of the saints. That Greek word is the word from which we get the word rapture. That is an event that has no signs. Could it happen this afternoon? It could happen this afternoon. It could happen in the next five minutes. It could happen in 300 years from now. But there's no signs of this. And the Lord himself comes off the throne, off the right hand of the majesty on high, and he descends from that third heaven to the second heaven. He comes in the clouds. We, which are alive and remain, and the dead in Christ, will be resurrected. Our bodies will be resurrected and will meet him where? In those same clouds. <clears throat> we will never again depart from his presence. Hallelujah for that. So we've said this before. Jesus Christ comes down <clears throat> and sets up his initial coming right in the midst of the prince of the power of the air. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that's exciting. So the second coming, which is at the end of the seven years of the times of Jacob's trouble, mentioned in Daniel as that last week, seven sevens, here at the end of that seven-year period, Christ is coming where? From the, not from the throne, but from the clouds, and he comes from the clouds back to, back to earth. And this is in agreement <clears throat> with exactly what he said in the book of Acts chapter 1. When he ascended up, <clears throat> he ascended up into the clouds, and the angels told those apostles that he would come back in like manner. He would descend from the clouds back onto the earth. Now what had happened with this church was, as we go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, they had been disturbed by false teaching. <clears throat> and this false teacher had come to them, look in chapter 2 and verse 2, either by spirit, meaning, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, that it was an actual person, a false teacher who showed up in their midst and taught that church something that was contrary to what Paul had spoken, or it was by word, that is, it was verbal, <clears throat> could have been preaching, teaching, they could have said, well, I was listening to the Apostle Paul, and that's not what he said, and here's what really he said. But it was coming to them through teaching or verbal conversation, and that was disturbing them. So it could have been an actual false teacher. could have been the spread of false teaching that had come that, their way. Or, look in verse 2 again of chapter 2. It could have actually come to them <clears throat> through an epistle that was forged as being from the Apostle Paul. And he said, look, it could be by letter as from us, meaning Paul, could it have been Timothy? Could it have been Savanus? The answer to that is yes. They are the ones that send their greetings to this church. He said, as from us. <clears throat> but more than likely, it was from the Apostle Paul and there were false letters being circulated in that day. Just like there are false books around today, aren't there? Now what was, do you remember, what was the sign of an authentic letter from the apostle in those apostolic times? 
Yeah, it was his signature, and it was a signature that was written with large letters. So he would sign it, Paulos, and he would sign it with big letters, and that would be the sign that this letter was authentic. Now, as those letters, which were authentic, were copied, they would not have copied the what? They would not have copied the signature. That would have been forgery. Okay? So we don't have any letters that have his large signature on it. Those have been destroyed, but we have copies of the copy. But in that day, that was one of the ways the early church, the apostolic church, judged whether or not a letter claiming to be from the Apostle Paul was actually authentic. Do you remember what the second way they tested it was? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the second way they tested it was by putting the teaching against known teaching. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says, Now if a prophet get up and speak, let that be in turn, and let the other prophets judge. So brethren, here we are today, just kind of bring it into, you know, 2018. Here we are today. We can't judge whether or not preaching or teaching is apostolically authentic by their signature. But how can we judge whether or not a person or a writing like a blog post or something on the internet, right? Or something that you hear from another person or a book that is written, how can we judge whether or not that that teaching is authentic? Well, here's, it's in the same way. Number one, we take that teaching and compare it to Christian orthodoxy. Right? We compare that to what we know is true and has been proven true throughout church history. And what is the second way? Well, we don't have apostolic signatures. That would have helped, right? But we don't have that. How do we do that? We compare it to apostolic teaching. We do have apostolic teaching, do we not? We have our New Testament. We have all the words that Jesus Christ intended for the church to have. He states that in John chapter 16. So in like manner, we do exactly the same thing. So if someone came up to you and said, Hey, listen to me. I just found a long lost book from Paul. What would you say? Well, it's not apostolic times, number one. And number two, we have everything that God has intended for us to have. And number three, more than likely, either A, this long lost book would not say anything but what has already been said. And if it did give new revelation, it would contradict the known orthodox teaching of the apostles that have been handed down in the church through local New Testament churches. We would know that. And, of course, we have books like that today. We call the Apocrypha. You go into the Apocrypha, there's teachings in there that are not in the New Testament, but there are also teachings in there that contradict what? The New Testament. That doesn't mean you can't read them, okay? It doesn't mean that you can't get any profit through them, but they are not inspired and they are not canonical. Now, why was this church alarmed? This church was shaken. Look at verse 2 again of chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians. He says that you be not soon shaken in mind. So what had happened was they had been steadfast, immovable in what Paul had taught. And when they heard this teaching, whatever this teaching was, it earthquaked, as it were, shook, It earthquaked that sound, settled teaching that was in their mind. And Paul was shocked, not that they would have earthquakes, so to speak. He was shocked, verse 2, at how soon they had these earthquakes. 
Now you remember how old was this church at the writing of 2 Thessalonians? Probably, we're guessing, probably how many? Well, maybe some nine months, right? Maybe 12 months old in the Lord. Paul is surprised about that. In fact, he expects them to remember what he has taught. Look at verse 5 of chapter 2. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. Don't you remember this? You're supposed to remember what the preacher teaches and what the scripture gives to you. But why were they alarmed? Why were they shook? Well, evidently, and we're guessing here, but I think it's it's a good, educated guess, that this false teacher had taught, look at verse 2 again, that they were in the day of Christ. They were in the day of the Lord. They were in that seven-year tribulation period. And that false teacher had denied what? He had denied Paul's teaching, that new revelation that we call the rapture of the church. He denied that. He just categorically denied that that was not so, that they were already in the day of the Lord, that seven-year tribulation period. Now, brethren, that would be disturbing on two accounts. First of all, here's a man claiming Paul's wrong, right? That would be disturbing because if he's wrong on the gathering together of the church, the rapture, he might be wrong what? He might be wrong on the gospel. So that would be shaking their faith. But here's the second thing that I think occurred in which we as Bible-believing saints do do. They looked at their circumstances. What were their circumstances? Well, they were under suffering and persecution. This has been going on for nine plus months. They had lost some of their members to death under this suffering and persecution. Who was the emperor? Nero. What was Nero doing with the, the bodies of living saints, true believers? Not only was he putting them in the gladiator situation, eaten by bees, fighting gladiators, but he actually would cloak them in rags and and light those rags on fire and light his garden parties. I would call that persecution, wouldn't you? So they looked around at all this persecution that was going on and said, you know what? This guy's claiming that we're in the day of the Lord. I know he's denying what Paul taught us, But I've looked at the circumstances and what does it look like? It looks like they're in the... It looks like they're in the day of the Lord. And so, brethren, we concluded by saying this. Don't be so easily alarmed by the newspapers of the day. We don't listen to teaching and say to ourselves, well, I feel that's right, so it must be right. That's not how we judge whether teaching is right or not. We don't listen to teaching and say to ourselves, well, what is going on in my life? We don't listen to teaching and say to ourselves, well, what's going on in the newspaper or the internet or the blog or the Googles of the day? We don't go by the Twitter accounts that we have or the Facebooks. How do we judge teaching? We judge teaching, scriptural teaching, by the scripture. Does the scripture actually confirm this teaching? Whether the newspapers confirm it, no matter what our feelings may say, It's comparing, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it's comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. It's comparing scripture upon scripture. That means you must be where? You must be in your Bibles. You must be reading your Bible. You must be studying your Bible. You must be wanting to know the Lord through the scriptures to be able to do this. Do people come to certain doctrines today by the newspaper? Oh, yeah. 
when Hitler was <clears throat> marching through Europe and persecuting, murdering Jewish people and Christians, the church, many in the church in that day, was saying that Hitler was the Antichrist. We're going to find out he isn't the Antichrist. Did he have characteristics of the Antichrist? The answer was yes. But he wasn't the Antichrist, but that was popular teaching of that day. What were they doing? They were looking at the circumstances and trying to match those events with what's in the Bible. Now, you go to the Bible and find out what the events are. Then you have the ability to discern at that moment. So let me remind you, here's what Paul is saying. <clears throat> They're saying that the day of Christ is at hand. Paul is saying, verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. So if you want to know what's the point of the message, very simply, you ready? <laughs> we <clears throat> are not in the day of the Lord. Now, you and I might say, well, that's self-obvious, but I'm telling you there are believing people who teach that we are in the day of the Lord. We are not in the day of the Lord. Don't let anyone deceive you by any means. Well, what means is he talking about here in verse 3? Well, he's referring back to verse 2. Whether it be by spirit, that is false teacher, or by word, or by letter as from us. Don't let any man deceive you by any of those means. In fact, he's going to tell them, look in chapter 2 in verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught whether by word or our epistle, he refers right back to these three same means. Don't let anyone deceive you. Don't be easily shook. Don't be earthquaked in your faith. And Lord willing, we're going to look at some of the ways that we do read the news and get earthquaked in our faith. Don't be deceived by any means. So if I was to ask you, are we in the day of the Lord? Answer, no. You didn't need to write a book about that. The answer is <clears throat> no. Why is that? Well, <clears throat> brethren, there are two reasons that Paul gives to prove that we are not in the day of the Lord. And it is fascinating to me. He only takes ten verses to disprove this. It's like this is so self-evident. Here it is. There are two reasons given to prove to the Thessalonians and to us <clears throat> that we are not in the day of the Lord. Well, look at verse 3. First reason. There is to come a falling away first. That phrase falling away is our word from which we get the word apostasy. So there's going to be a great <clears throat> apostasy. What's the important word here? First. Secondly, <clears throat> verse 3, <clears throat> we know we're not in the day of the Lord because... When the day of the Lord comes, somewhere in that seven-year time frame, the man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to be revealed. And that son of perdition, man of sin, is not yet. So we know that we are not in the day of the Lord. So let me, <clears throat> let me just round this out for you and kind of, I'm going to give you a, a, a time calendar without telling you what's going to happen every hour. Okay? This is a Pauline time character. What's the first thing that's going to happen? <clears throat> well, it's going to be the what of the church? The rapture of the church. Then there is going to be... <clears throat> And there could be some overlap with this. I think personally there is. 
then there's going to be what we call the great apostasy. That great apostasy will occur when, look at verse 6, whatever is withholding this will be removed. In other words, the restraining, now please, please list this, this will set us up for the next message. The restraining, verse 7, of the mystery of iniquity. And what that mystery of iniquity is trying to bring to pass. The restraint of that will be removed. And there is this apostasy, and then there is this man of lawlessness that is going to be revealed. And then what comes at the end? Christ comes back from the clouds to the earth to take his rightful 1,000-year millennial reign. Now, that's pretty detailed, isn't it? I mean, that does give to us certain evidences that would let us know very simply that we are not in the day of the Lord, no matter how hard things get. And, brethren, can things get harder in America? I hope you're nodding your head yes, because however hard you think it is, it is nowhere near as hard as it could be. We're not having anybody being lit up and used as LEDs at their garden parties. <clears throat> now, why is Paul doing this? Why is Paul dipping into the Old Testament? Why didn't he just say... Well, the first thing that's going to happen is the rapture, and isn't it kind of self-evident that the rapture hasn't what? It hasn't happened. Why doesn't Paul say that? He doesn't say that, brethren, because, remember, the rapture was new revelation, right? That'd be like me teaching that the moon is cheese. So I get up here, I say, the moon is cheese, the moon is cheese. Someone says, ah, the moon isn't cheese. Prove it. I say to you, well, I can prove to you the moon is cheese because I said so. Well, that's nice and authoritative, but does that prove anything? That doesn't prove anything. So Paul couldn't prove the rapture through Old Testament teaching because it wasn't there. It was new revelation. So what he did to prove they weren't in the day of the Lord is dip into the Old Testament revelation concerning that seven-year period. And remember, brethren, Paul had already taught them these things. And this is amazing because how long was Paul there at this church? Was he there like two and a half, three years? No, he was only, te he was only there up to three Sabbath days. That's some three weeks to six weeks, depending on how you do the chronology. That's not a long time. But he expected that church to hear what he had taught, to remember what he had taught, and to put it in practice. And brethren, what that teaches us <clears throat> is this, that what we hear taught, if what that teaching is, is what the scripture is saying, Christ expects us to hear it, to obey it, and to remember it. And every preacher that is from the Lord expects you to remember it, even though we know in practice that we're going to have to tell you more than one time because we have to tell ourselves more than one time. So what are the two reasons that we know that we are not in the day of the Lord? First of all, one word, apostasy. Second, <clears throat> the revealing of that man of sin. And as I mentioned before this afternoon, we will look at some characteristics outside of this passage of that man of sin. So let's look. The, let's look at these two things. Paul's going to elaborate on this. He does mention the apostasy, doesn't he? 
And he's going to elaborate that on verse 10 through 12 of this same chapter. But I'm just going to keep it kind of right here as much as I'm able to for this morning. So what do we know? Well, there is going to come, verse 3, a falling away first. There is going to be a mass departure from the Christian faith. The word apostatize means to abandon. In fact, in the Old Testament, in our King James translation, the word backsliding is the Greek term for apostasy. There's going to come a mass abandoning of the Christian faith. This will be, as it were, global. Okay, everybody with me? Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that during the seven-year tribulation period that there will be no genuine believers. Will there be genuine believers in that seven-year tribulation period? We know from the book of Revelation the answer to that is what? Yes. But it does mean this, brethren, that nowhere... Look, genuine believers will nowhere near be the majority. Now, this abandoning of the Christian faith in that seven-year time frame doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to abandon the Christian faith for another religion. It's not like they're going to abandon the Christian faith and, and become Muslim. What it means is, is that there is going to be an abandonment from the true Christian faith that was once delivered to the saints for another form of so-called Christianity. And that spirit, this other form of so-called Christianity, is in the world today, isn't it? And we do know also... from other passages that the Antichrist is going to make things very black and very white. You're either going to worship him as God or die. That's pretty black and white, isn't it? Because in order to buy or sell, you're going to have to have his what? His mark. So when this becomes very black and white, as much black and white as you think it is now, it's not very black and white, but when it just comes, you have two choices. How many people do you think that profess Christ will abandon the true faith for a piece of bread? What do you think? If you don't think that's a temptation, you've never been hungry. What's it going to be like in Christian homes where maybe the man says, we're going to worship the beast, and the wife says no? Or what if a teenage boy takes a stand for Christ and the whole family's worshiping the beast, but he can't buy or sell, and so he can't eat? There's going to be great oppression, isn't there, brother? So there's going to be this great apostasy. And that apostasy, now please hear what I'm about to say. This will really help you in interpreting your Bible. This great apostasy, which occur when? When is this great apostasy occurring? In the seven-year tribulation period. <clears throat> What, is, what will happen in the future is happening in smaller scale today. Everybody with me? <clears throat> in other words, things are being set up for this. So what is... Now follow this. What's true in the future, that great apostasy, is also true 
not in its fullness like in the seven year tribulation, but it is in a smaller scale today. Question. In the New Testament, is there the Antichrist? Yes or no? Yes. He's going to be revealed in what time period? The day of the Lord. That's seven year tribulation period. All right. Are there Antichrists today? First John says what? There are. We'll look at that tonight. So, so what we have is the apostasy going on in that seven-year tribulation period. But we do have apostasy going on today. We do have the Antichrist being revealed in that seven-year tribulation period. We also have Antichrist, plural, today. Everybody with me? In that seven-year tribulation period, are there going to be great earthquakes? Revelation says so, doesn't it? Do we have earthquakes today? In that seven-year tribulation period, is there going to be the famine? Do we have famines today? And see, that's what brings the confusion to people. That the characteristics of that day are evident today. But it is not the Antichrist. It is not the day of the Lord. Let me take a final example. Is there the day of the Lord? Did Israel experience days of the Lord? The Babylonian invasion was called the day of the Lord, a time of judgment. But is, was that Babylonian invasion the day of the Lord? No, but it had characteristics of the day of the Lord. Okay, everybody with me? That's why it's sometimes it's so confusing when you read and listen to certain things, you're like, are we in the day? Are, is this going on right now? Is this what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24 and 25? No, we are not in the day of the Lord. Are there characteristics of that day today and possibly growing? Answer, yes. <clears throat> so, what we know, first of all, is that there's going to be this mass departure from the Christian faith. Secondly, there's going to be this revealing, <clears throat> look at verse 3, there's going to be a revealing of what the Bible calls the man of sin or the man of lawlessness and the son of perdition or the son of destruction. Now, brethren, these two names <clears throat> give to us not merely his actions, but who he is. He is a man of lawlessness. Well, what does that mean? Well, John teaches us in 1 John <clears throat> that the very essence of sin is lawlessness. Or I could word it this way. No law. I find this amazing. Because one of the things that men keep multiplying are laws. Right? Now I won't go into why all that is. I just want to bring that out to our attention. <clears throat> but this man is a man whose characteristic is this. No law. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't have laws. <laughs> does he pass a law about the mark of the beast? Mm -hmm. He does. What does this mean, no law? Well, it means this. <clears throat> the only law that he will obey is himself. In other words, <clears throat> let's say... You had a law in your house. Here's a law. Ready, children? You can't chew gum on the couch. Why can't I chew gum on the couch? Well, <clears throat> you might spit it out and it get on the couch, stick on the couch, and that's going to cause all kinds of what? Parents, tell me, what's that going to cause? All kinds of... 
oh, it's going to be a mess, it's going to be a problem, you might even have to replace the couch. I mean, money's going to be involved, right? So you pass this law, no chewing on the couch. What does a person of lawlessness say? I mean, what do sinners say when they hear something like that? I can chew gum on that couch if I want to. In other words, are they going to abide by that external law? No. What does judges call this? What does God say in the book of Joseph? Over, over and over and over. Every man does that which is right, let's finish, in his own. That's lawlessness. And Psalm 2 says that the nations of the earth are gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us cast his bonds apart from us. In other words, the sole movement of this world is not that they don't ever give any laws. They do. Laws of unrighteousness. <clears throat> the movement of this world is, I'm not going to obey what God has said. Everybody see that? But this man's not only going to do that. He's not going to obey any laws except his own. So what does that mean? Well, it means this, brethren, that if you were living in those days, and we are not, we have a blessed hope, <clears throat> but if you were living, and there will be believers in that day, if they went to, in his kingdom, if they went to his courts for justice, do you think they would get justice? No. Have you ever, have you ever said this about American justice? That's not fair. You ever said that? Have you ever said to yourself, how can that judge make that type of judgment? That's not what the law says. Have you ever said something like that to yourself? Have you ever said, well, it's no sense me going to law because I don't have the money to go to law and I'm not going to get justice anyway. You ever thought things like that? Why is that? Lawlessness. It's not that there's no laws, it's that they're not going to what? They're not going to obey them. And we have a whole nation of politicians that are exercising their lawlessness. They, it's not that they don't know what the Constitution says. It's not that they don't know what state governments say. It's not that they can't read the writings of the founding of our fathers. It's that they're not going to do it because they are men of lawlessness. And does that mean the revealing of that man has been revealed? No, it means this, that the spirit of lawlessness is already at work. Everybody with me? Secondly, he's going to be a, uh, the son of destruction. What's interesting about this term is, is that this term was used of another man in the scripture. Who remembers that name? His name is Judas. And that is very instructive <clears throat> because of how Judas conducted himself. How many of the disciples said to themselves, I know Judas, he can't be a believer. That's the one. I mean, when our Lord got up and said, one of you is going to betray me, we all turned around and said, you, 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 you. Did they do that? No. You're not going to recognize this man, brethren, until he's revealed by his activity. Years ago, I don't remember how many years ago, and I mentioned this sporadically before, I was watching a documentary <clears throat> on public broadcasting system, and they had a round table of three or four important leaders from Europe that were surrounding that table, and they were talking about the politics and the problems of that day. And I couldn't believe it. I, I heard this. I can't document it because I didn't write it down. I didn't write down the day. I didn't write the day the documentary. I saw it on. But you'll just have to trust me. I really did hear this. 
One of those men got up and he said, the only solution for our problems is for a single man to rise up in power and solve it. The mystery of lawlessness is already what? It's already at work. Now here's the thing, brethren. Could that man be living right now? Could he? What do you think? Well, you think he's going to be born at the beginning of the seven-year period, and he's going to say, hey, I'm going to be the leader. I'm three and a half years old. No, he could be living today, right? He has to be living before the rapture, before that day of the Lord commences, for him to be revealed in that day. And he could be living today. But his characterization is one of destruction. This means that his activity is one of destroying versus building up. Edifying. The Bible tells believers do everything for building up, not destroying. This man of sin will be characterized by his activity and actions and person of destroying. Now, brethren, what makes this so amazing? This past week, as I've really doubled down and tried to prepare my own spirit through study and prayer over this passage, I have actually... There, there have been times that I have felt fear in my soul for our brethren. And the reason for that is, is because, look at verse 4. <clears throat> when that man is revealed, this, this man of lawlessness, this son of destruction, verse 4, he's going to oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Is everybody with me? He is in opposition. Or we can say this. He's anti-who? He's anti-Christ. But here's the thing, brethren. He's not anti-Christ alone. He is in opposition, direct opposition. This is a participle, so this is be true during his whole reign. He is in continual opposition opposition or opposing all that is called God. Not just Christianity. Now I want to ask you this question. How many gods do you think there are on the earth today? What do you think? Well, I'll help you. Let's do the other first. He says he's going to oppose all that is called God or that is worshipped. Whether it's called a God or not. So I went over, brought up my little safari, and I typed in this question to Mr. Google. How many religions are there on the earth today? This is what Mr. Google said. This isn't right. But it's a number. <clears throat> there are 4,200 different religions on the earth today. He, this man, is anti how many of them? All of them. He will oppose and abolish Christianity. He will oppose and abolish Islam. He will oppose and abolish, and they call this a religion. I looked this up. Top five religions. You know what the third top religion is? Ready? Secularism. He will abolish Hindu worship. He will abolish Buddhistic worship. He will abolish All forms of Asiatic worship, non-traditional worship. What do you think about that? 
You think that's happened? Yes or no? Has that happened? Are we in the day of the Lord? No. It's not just against Christianity, although he's going to give his most fury to that. But he's against all things that are worshipped. And he's against all gods. And brethren, there is no way out of 4,200 religions that I could even guess how many gods there are. There are so many gods in Hinduism, you can't count them. And he is going to use the force of military. He's going to use the force of economy. He's going to use the force of government against all things that are called God or that are worshipped. Why is that? He's going to demand exclusive worship of who? Himself. Now, I just, I just think about being a believer in that type of situation, <clears throat> and, and I do feel fear. And brethren, secondly, what he's going to do in his being revealed is this. <clears throat> he's going to exalt himself. Look at verse 4 again. He sets himself in direct opposition to all that is called God or that is worshipped, he's going to be exalting, it's a participle, he's going to be exalting himself above all that is called God or is worshipped. So what is his opinion going to be about Muhammad? He's better. What's his opinion going to be about Jesus? He's better. What's his opinion going to be about the multitude of Hindu gods? Better. What's he going to be about Buddha? Better. Right? And not just better, alone. This is where the mystery of iniquity is moving. He will exalt himself. If you think our president is prideful, wait. If you think our former president was prideful, wait. If you've met someone and you walked away and saying, that guy is arrogant, just wait. He's going to exalt himself, not only going to oppose all that is called God or his worship, he's going to exalt himself over all that is called God or his worship. <clears throat> and the resulting action of that, look at verse 4, is that he will, as God, sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's amazing. <clears throat> And let me give you some amazing things about this. Look at verse 4 again. You see the phrase, if you have a King James Bible, so that. This is the result of his exalting and opposing all that is God or is worshipped. <clears throat> so that this is what he does. Does he claim that he's God? Yes or no? Yes. He, as God goes into, <clears throat> I believe, the temple of God at Jerusalem. And he sits in that temple and declares he's what? He's God. But brethren, he just doesn't go in and declare that he's God. He exhibits that he's God. That's what the phrase, showing himself that he is God. He puts himself on exhibition and proves to the world <clears throat> that not only what he says, I am God, but he will do things that absolutely dogmatically in the eyes of this world prove that he is who? That he's God. And you'll note in verse 9 of this chapter <clears throat> that it says 
that this working of power that exhibits that he is God is the working of Satan. Now note, note what it says. With all power. How much power? All the power of who? Of that fallen angel Lucifer. With all power and signs and lying wonders. He's going to call fire out of heaven. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? He's going to do things more than that. And every one of those signs to a lost and dying world is going to make one statement. He's God. And they're going to believe it. They're going to believe it for the sake of their own economic prosperity. They're going to believe it for the sake of the saving of their own lives. They're going to believe it for their own comforts because they don't want to suffer and be persecuted. They're going to believe it because it's to their advantage to believe it. And they're going to believe it because down in their hearts, they too have the spirit of lawlessness. They will rejoice that world peace has finally come. Because that man of sin will force it to be so. Now, brethren, as we conclude, I hope you realize by now that everything that I've described to you is the exact opposite of our Lord. This man of sin, does he exalt himself? The Bible says Jesus humbled himself even unto death. The death of what? The cross. He said of me, I am meek and lowly, learn of me. That's not what the man of sin is going to say. The man of sin is going to say, you worship me or die. This man of sin shows that he is God Because he uses the powers of Satan in opposition to God to force people to recognize that he is God. Do you realize, brethren, that God wants us to serve him out of love? Right? He wants you to voluntarily choose Christ. He's not out forcing you. He's not saying, now, if you don't don't become a Christian, I'm not going to feed you anymore. Does God feed lost people? Does God shower the rain on the rich and the poor and the unbeliever and the believer? Answer, yes. The Antichrist will not be that way. It's all about force. It's all about imposition. It's all about you bowing the knee whether your heart is in agreement with that or not. Because he's God. But in Isaiah 53 and verse 5, The Bible says that Christ was pierced for our lawlessness. Did Jesus live under the law? Yes or no? Did he obey the law for our sakes? The answer to that is, he's not lawless, brethren. When you find someone who claims to be a Christian, but they live their lives lawlessly, that is in direct opposition to what they say. Christians rejoice in the law of God. When we hear, you'll love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind and strength, we know we don't do that, right? But isn't there something in you that wants to do that you don't say i'm not doing that kind of law that's bad law you know that gum on the couch that's bad stuff if he says don't use the lord's name in vain it's not that we're perfect or sinless but boy don't we want to never do that we want to voluntarily place ourselves under his righteous laws because they're life to those who have the spirit of god in them Lost people are chafing under the law. Now, they'll bend if you force them to, either by reward or by punishment or imprisonment, 
or taking away their privileges. That's what we do to kids, right? You say, now, if you don't do what I say, time out in that corner. Well, you haven't changed anything in the child's heart. You're just forcing the child to do what? To do what you say, but when they get to be 16, 17, or 18, you know what? You're not big enough to force it anymore. We need a change of heart. And that change of heart from lawlessness to righteousness comes through our Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our lawlessness. And he was buried and he rose again so that for our justification that we might be declared righteous. That we might be born again and given a new heart. A heart of love, obedience. So that we might be conformed into His image. So that one day I'll live in His kingdom joyfully. And that all of His laws will be in my heart completely. There will be no obstruction to me doing them because I want to do them. And they will be a joy because I'm doing it out of love, not by duty. They will be who I am. What peace will be in that day? So brethren, again, going back to, you say, well, what's the point of the message? What's the point of the text? Are we in the day of the Lord? Absolutely what? Not. And you know it from the Old Testament scripture. So let us remember that when your newspaper shakes your faith.